This is Creativity Drill with Dr. Don and Jonathan Rundman. Hey, everybody. This is your co-host, Jonathan Rundman, and we're really glad you're listening to our podcast, Creativity Drill, which features poet Beth Roberts, who also happens to be my cousin. It's the first time we've had a family member on the show, and it's really awesome, so we're so glad you're listening. We try not to uh, take notes or do any... Because it's not a, it's not an interview, it's right. it's a conversation. Right. So here, how about why don't you uh, snuggle up as close to the mic, like maybe three inches away, and uh, why don't you say the alphabet for me? A B C D E F G. Okay, you can get a little closer. H I J K L M N O P. Excellent. And Don, can you talk for me too, please? Q R S T U V W X. Y and Z. Oh, We're doing a sound check. <laughs> we are doing a sound check. <clears throat> are the My levels mom can okay? Say it backwards. Your mom can say the alphabet backwards. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I know. Has she always did she learn it as a kid? It's sort of a fun trick. She learned it when she was teaching children, and oh. I don't remember why she decided that was a good idea. But she's a perfectionist. <laughs> I bet it would. I bet it would captivate their attention, though. <laughs> I guess. What's your favorite letter? <clears throat> My favorite letter? Yeah. Okay, I have to think about this. Mm, I suppose why. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> why? 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 <laughs> because why is versatile. It's some, sometimes it's a vowel. Exactly. It's got a nice shape, too. Here, Dawn, Ooh. can you scooch over this way? and? Uh, sure. We can move this. I was so excited when you were going to be on because I we haven't had a poet on the show, and it's fun to talk about words. And I wondered if you had uh, preferences over uh, nouns, verbs, or adjectives. Parts of speech. Yeah. Do you have a favorite part of grammar? Verbs. That, really? For sure. You like verbs the best. Yeah. Because I'm. A, I think I like nouns. But yeah, but why are? Tell me about verbs. Why are they? Mm, why do you like them? Well, because you take a noun, any noun. Right? Like fawn, for example, is a noun. <laughs> and then that's the end of it. But you add a verb, and all of a sudden, you can go in so many different directions. Right? Well, you need a verb to go in any direction. <laughs> but, <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But that changes, uh, that creates a story, actually. I mean, you have a character, but you know the character is incomplete. The noun um, character is incomplete until the... The character actually does something, and so you need verbs. Um, similarly, I think adverbs are better than adjectives because they're um, more expansive. Adjectives are more limiting. Uh huh. I wondered if poets actually think about grammar, and or if you're just riffing on thoughts and ideas, or does it ever come down to the building blocks of grammar? Well, it depends on the poet, I guess. Um, I'm a fan of grammar. I um, used to teach English, and I taught um, composition, writing composition. Did you have Mrs. Jacopi in eighth grade? No. Okay. No, but I know who she is. Okay. I've heard the story. <laughs> yes. Um, but, in fact, I think in order to use poetic license, you have to know what you're doing, you, which means you have to know which rules you're breaking and... You know, I think that it's better to to know the language before you start taking liberties with it. Are you a stickler for grammar just in speaking and normal life? Yes. Okay. And what is poetic license? I mean, everyone uses that. I'm going to take poetic license. I mean, people say that all the time. Do they say that? I mean, I hear that out there in, in the world, but I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. Or they might not be using it correctly. Yeah. Well, adjective. No, adverb. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think taking poetic license, you know, I think people are using it all the time. It, they're, they're using it as a, as, a, as a metaphor for going their own way, probably, or breaking the rules. Um, but in fact, it, it really means getting creative with your word choices and, you know, what you're doing with language. Um, generally, I think in writing, they'll use it more often, and it just means that th- there's a good reason 
for breaking the rules and, mm. and they might know what it is or sense what it is. Um, but you know, it's worth it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It'll be worth it. Do you find, what, do you take poetic license when you're writing poems? Well, I mean, I think that, I think maybe, I suppose it depends on what the definition finally of poetic license is, but probably that's, that's what, that's the first, that's the entryway, that's the foyer for a poem is to, to go through poetic license to begin to diverge from, from the expected, you know, um, like with fiction, for example, it's a little bit more predictable. You have characters, there's a storyline, there's a plot, you sense a plot, and this is very generally speaking, um, but you pretty much know, you know, you have to move characters across a room, they have to deal with nouns, you know, they have to deal with stuff that they do, um, and, but usually, you know, in the narrative, it's just more linear, and you you sort of know the kind of event that's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. But with poetry, you don't necessarily know the kind of event that's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I think like my favorite kinds of poems are the ones that really ask, um, are are really themselves asking questions, and so they cause the readers to ask questions of themselves, and. Um, even if the answers aren't reached, which I think the best poems don't really reach the answers, they just create new questions. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really taking poetic license, I think. You don't, you know, you're just asking permission to do something strange and different and not have any clue or answer about what's going to happen next. You keep saying the word character when you're talking about this, and I'm yeah. wondering, when you're writing poetry, are you thinking, are you casting it like a film or like a novel? Do you see or things th- in your head? Or do you mm-hmm. feel them or get uh, just a, a sense? Yeah. Because I think about like songwriting, mm-hmm. often, if the song is written from Jonathan's perspective, mm-hmm. I, I can see how, in retrospect, that I might be using a character and that I'm the character or that someone representing me is the character. But right. I'm not consciously thinking that way as I'm writing the lyric. And so uh, do you ever set out to say this, the person who's saying this is this kind of person? Or like, yeah. what is that? What's going on there? I would think that we have some things in common as far as writing lyrics for songs and, and writing poems. I don't... I don't, characters would be, I think, too far removed from me, and yet I'm not in the poem itself. There's a persona, maybe. I mean, it might be very close to me. I mean, it had better be close to me, because, um, you know, it just, let's see now. I think persona is probably more um, applicable than character for poems. Um, And I've, you know, I've been thinking recently about Lyric writing compared with poet poetry writing, I think there is a difference. Why? What? Why are you thinking about that? Why am these I? Days? Yeah. Well, because my son Ivan is really he's writing songs, and uh, you know Ivan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, I have friends who write music, and a boyfriend who writes songs, and um, and he also writes poetry. And I th- some people who do both um, really think that it's very much the same I think not him especially but you know I really don't at least not for myself when I write a poem I do think of a voice which is and if you know if it's if, it, if it's a little bit more narrative then it might be a persona not a character that's moved from place to place or or you know develops or is part of a storyline necessarily but a, uh, you know, there's a there's a person there, um, but I also I also aim for um, a sense of music in poems, mm-hmm. and I suppose it's it's a rhythm, um, and it's you know a sound and a rhythm, um, and that's how I I land on a poem usually is um, with a, a question and a number of different elements that are compelling to me at the moment. Maybe something happened, and that's maybe part of the narrative. 
Um, and then I, I try to land on this, this, this rhythm or this certain sound. But all of that is more important than the character and the poem or the persona, mm-hmm. even. The rhythm and the sound is more important. Yeah. yeah. So when, when you're writing, are you writing and speaking, actually? Like, are you, are you talking to yourself when you're in the throes of writing? Um, to hear how it sounds? <clears throat> like, actually vocalize it? Yeah, yeah. I do that later. Uh, when I'm writing, it's, it's just all in the mind, I guess, and the fingers, you know. I mean, computers are great for... It's much better than a typewriter these days. <laughs> but, but later, in order to land on whether or not it's working, I, I read it out loud, usually, and that usually shows me where it's gone awry and what needs to be fixed, you know, because the sound might not be quite right, and I think the, the, the voice will tell you that, so I read it out loud to myself. Hmm. I was talking to somebody in the last months about songwriting. In fact, I had written a song that I was nervous about mm-hmm. because I thought it was too over the top. Like, what do that, you mean? Like that the, the lyric was too um, pushy and too extreme. How do you mean? Well, it was, it was a song sort of about to being frustrated and that sort of thing. And, and so the... The lyrics were really kind of uh, depressing and over the top, or sort of. And it wasn't even the, my reality necessarily, but it it mm-hmm. really s- felt like a song if I yeah. took it that far. Um, but I felt uh, nervous about it, and so I made a YouTube video of the song that was on a private link, and then I Facebooked uh, some songwriter and lyricist friends of mine, uh, and shared the private link with them so they could watch the little demo video of me playing the song. And I said, mm-hmm. what do you think? Of, is this just too much? And some of the people thought it was too much. And some of the people thought it was fine. And a friend of mine said, there is something to be said for hyper- hyperbole. Yeah, okay. And, and I had never thought about that before as I mean I heard, you know you hear that word but I had never consciously said I'm going to use I'm going to now utilize hyperbole you right. know I never right. think that way but like so there was this one one way to think about it which is that hyperbole is a tool that you can use that's that's a legitimate tool yes and ultimately I decided to that I couldn't get behind the the, the lyric as a person, like as Jonathan, the real guy, even though I could identify that, yeah, it was kind of a interesting and cool and, you know, in and of itself, it was pretty good, but I couldn't. At the at, moment, you mean it was. Yeah. And at the moment and just who I am as a person, it didn't feel like the kind of thing I could get behind as the artist. Yeah. So ultimately I shelved it and decided to not go down that path anymore. Yeah. But it, it, got, it got me thinking about hyperbole as an idea that sometimes you choose to go beyond where you really are in order just to just because that's where the the muse is taking you yeah you know what i mean so it's worthwhile at that moment i think to do that it doesn't mean it needs to continue ah but i think that's okay it's an exercise it's an exercise yeah and you might go back to that later and say i'm going to write a song about hyperbole (laughs) totally yeah that's so interesting to hear you say this because i am so uh rooted in function over form Mm -hmm. as a composer and a lyricist and and it's because i I guess i get so much satisfaction out of getting to play a song that i write that i become all about function Hmm. at at all costs and so i sort of sacrifice form oftentimes for the sake of function and i of course i intellectually understand that both of those are legit and you can and and going either direction is equally valid, but because I'm so passionate about using the the music that I write, yeah, I want it super super useful, yeah. <laughs> and so I tend to steer away from those more form or impractical or hyper, hyperbolic mm-hmm. kinds of things because I feel like ah, it's just not useful. It's not useful enough. Yeah, isn't isn't that weird? No, like does that ever happen to you? Um, I, hmm, let's see. I mean, I, I guess that's, the poems to me, the poems that strike me as the most useful are the ones that I, I can come back to later 
and not feel entirely um, let down <laughs> when I read them again. <laughs> you know, which of That's course a glowing happens. endorsement. <laughs> yes, you know, because um, I mean, I think that some of the poems I've written, I've written some poems which are which are fine. They're good, and and maybe some people really like them, but um, the ones that I find are worth reading again and again to myself are the ones that are not necessary, are the ones where um, I am not, well, gosh, now this is going to be kind of, the ones where I don't really see myself as as a person, you know, as this 50-year-old person living in the world with this life story and as the character in the world. I'm not in there. Uh-huh. But um, there's something more universal and, you know, for gosh sakes, you know, I have... How does that happen? But they're not really of of me, you mm. know. The ones that are that I think that um, I've got too many unanswered, an, unanswered. I have not answered any questions in them. They're they're there and they still inspire me because I don't feel very close to them yeah. myself. Yeah. But yet, there's something about them that that makes me feel like um, they're they're. They've got some truth, I guess. Yeah. And I think that's what makes them successful. How often do you get a poem where you have that feeling about it? Like you think, wow, this one really gets Mm -hmm. up above Beth or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's its own thing. Is it like 5% of the the time? Most of the poems that don't um, get above me, um, I just chuck. (laughs) You know, (laughs) because... So you just don't finish them. I just don't. Or I finish them, but then they're done and and they're not worth holding on to. So I really don't want the clutter. Right. And I'll just trash them. Okay. Do you you delete, like there's no more evidence of them? They're gone? Or do you keep them in a... Really? Yeah. Do do you write... I know you said you had a lot on your computer. Do you also write pen to paper occasionally? Um, Sometimes? I have a little notepad and I, I, I rarely do that. I know that we are all supposed to do that. Yeah. And I'm I do recommend it. I'm surprised to hear you, you say that you write on a computer. And I'm sorry. Yeah, but I had a vision of you with your calligraphy pen <laughs> and your fine, uh, your parchment that someone gave to you from Italy or right. something like that. I know. Like in your I studio, have that. scratching out the... I used to. I used to write on a drawing pad because it had more, you know, white space and uh-huh. I didn't have to worry about line lengths and... And all of that, but um, no, computers are great because um, you can just create all the white space you need, and and it's just fast. It's just faster. Mm-hmm. It's faster than writing. I mean, I love pens. I'm holding one right now, just out of nerves. <laughs> 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 you know, and it's a black pen because it has to be a black pen, and it's got a very micro, you know, fine point and all that. But um, <clears throat> no, the pens are pens are necessary, but. Yeah, no, I'm I'm a fan of the computer. <laughs> did you have a Did you have a switch in your in your writing career, like twenty years ago, ten years ago, five years ago? From oh. typewriter to computer. For, yeah. Oh, typewriter. So you typed instead I did. of written. I started on a. My sister had gotten um, Meredith, also Jonathan's cousin, um, had gotten a, a nice Corona, you know, electric typewriter for graduating from high school or something. Did know. she win it from the Lions Club? Um, I don't Maybe. know. I won. I won. I won a typewriter from Did the you? from the lines or the Kiwanis. Kiwanis was my dad. He was into Kiwanis. So okay, perhaps. Okay. Maybe it was that. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm well. part of her, the lineage of the. Yeah. <laughs> well, somehow, I just because I had declared an English major and creative writing major, I just decided that the typewriter should be mine. So I don't really okay. quite remember how that happened, but I took the typewriter. But when I was in grad school, you know. Back in, the, like, from 88 till 90, people were just, you know, making the switch to, to computers. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I just still had this typewriter. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I wrote... <laughs> was it an electric or a manual? Yeah, it was electric. Electric? Okay. Um, but still, a typewriter. And so I wrote my master's thesis on that. And, um, it takes a long time to write something on a typewriter. <laughs> well, I, I did it in one night. We all did. Wow. At the writer's workshop, that was the tradition, to do it in one night. Wow. And to be cool, which you had to be cool, <laughs> you had to write your thesis in one night. Well, the thesis only needed to be, I don't remember if it was 10 or 20 pages, 15 or 20. I don't remember how long it had to be. But um, but still, it was a tall order, and I stayed up all night. 
had to go back and use the whiteout and you know <laughs> no, isn't that amazing uh, I'm sure it's not the same way now but I think it's yeah. cool that you went to that writer's workshop in Iowa yeah. and now I, I think when you were there like I wasn't aware of the reputation that that place has and then over the years I would start hearing things about I think oh my gosh Beth went there what did you when you got in did you get, have a sense that wow I'm playing with the big dogs yeah I was thrilled really? yeah, because we knew I went to Western Michigan to Kalamazoo and and that's a um, you know I, I went there um, for undergrad and I was there for five years and when I when I first started there um, you know I'm the oldest in my family and and I didn't have the nerve to to well, I you know I, I hint, placed hints with my mom and dad that I wanted to be an English major and you know, they already knew that I liked writing poetry and but of course, like now, you know, we all felt that we had to do something that was going to gain us a job, um, hopefully not too far out from graduation. And they told me, well, you know, they had done some homework, said occupational therapy would be good for you because you like to be helpful and you can be creative. And I thought, <clears throat> well, I, I don't know what I, th- I mean, I, I, I didn't. I just sort of went ahead because I was the oldest in my family. I didn't really know how to how to deviate from from their good idea. Mm-hmm. So I did. I went for a year, but I was unhappy. And um, then I took that test. There's some test that tells you what kind of person you are, and there's another test that tells you what you should major in or what your you know field should be. In. Your aptitudes. Yes, your, your aptitudes. Vo- your vocational aptitude. Yeah. <laughs> so and then there's so what's the test that that has like the four letters. For you probably know this, Don. For personality, yeah, your personality test. The Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs, exactly. Okay. Ooh, do you remember what you're what you are? <clears throat> I, E, is it I or E? Introvert I, or extrovert? Introvert. Okay. Yeah. And then. Because I am, I'm an N- INFP. INFP. That's me. And Don's an INFJ. I'm an INFP. I think. Yeah, my cousin Beth is the same letters as me. <laughs> <laughs> I think Wait, what did I say in the first? So introvert. And then, uh, then intuitive ver- versus sensing. Yes, intuitive. And then uh, thinking and feeling. So that's the F, F part. And then uh, judging and perceiving. Perceiving, for sure. Yeah. All the way. So yeah, uh-huh. not, uh, knowing you and knowing the Myers-Briggs, I think you're an INFP. I mean, that makes, it makes sense to Well, me. it's been proven back in, you know, 1984. <laughs> so, <laughs> what was proven in 1984? That I have an INF. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I took the other test that tells you what you should go into, and and um, you know, it was on a. <clears throat> it basically told me that I could I could go, do whatever I wanted to do, but I should do according to my interests. The arts, 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 or like whatever, everything in the arts. Well, That's true. And this, INF, this like- INFPs are oftentimes musicians, poets, uh, educators, clergy. And idealists and kind of, you know, yeah. that's, it, it's, it's textbook INFP to be well, a poet. Oh, here, here. Yeah. So all of a sudden I had evidence to show my parents. Was this in high school you took this? No, that was at Western. At Michigan. Western. Okay. Because mm-hmm. the high school one is the, the armed services one. Like that oh, was, really? That was one of the tests. <laughs> Did you have that we, to take that? Well, you probably Muslim? did too. I don't remember it though. The, ar- the really? ASVAB, the armed services vocational aptitude huh. battery. <laughs> wow. You remember the... I, uh, I like strange a strange things I remember. <laughs> Dawn's drawn to testing and curriculum. <laughs> yeah. So, so you had a vocational assessment yes. in college that said go yeah. into the arts. So I you just could... went, to, went to the building that provided those services, you know, upon my parents' recommendation, and and gathered the evidence, and, okay. and they said, okay. Go for it. So that was great because then I was a much happier college student. Good. And, that might be good advice for our listeners that if you're thinking of the arts as a vocation it's and possible. you're and you're getting a little b- blowback from family or friends if you take a test and get some data about yourself and your just gifts present the data you can present the data and yeah. then you might justify your your motivations a yeah, little bit honestly as as mealy and as nebulous as numbers really are <laughs> certainly statistics <laughs> goodness me. parents still really go for that stuff so do it yeah. get yourself some numbers did you know you were going to get into iowa when you applied no of course not 
You didn't think so? Did you think there's no way this is going to happen? I don't even know what was going to happen next at all. I applied for colleges because that we were supposed to, I mean, grad uh-huh. schools because you were supposed to do that. Uh-huh. And um, actually, I, I really wanted to go to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville because I had a boyfriend who also applied there. So we thought we could go, and we actually went um, backpacking in the Smoky Mountains one spring break. And we had set up this little, you know, vision for our future. And even though he was brilliant, um, Neither one of us got into that school, <laughs> so we <laughs> broke up. But, no, I was really happy about Iowa. You know, I applied there because that was the dream school, and I knew that that was. And um, and another a friend of mine from the same program at Western got into Iowa at the same time, and that wow. was just so much fun because, um, you know, only like 50 poets and 50 fiction writers around the country. I don't know what it's like now, but wow. got in at that point, and so... Um, you know, our professors were really happy. It wow. was just nice, and it was just fun. Was so, when you got fun. there, you could you could you feel it? Like this is really a great place, and these people are really good. Well, I didn't know. I mean, everything was great to me then because I, life was you know you're uh-huh. young and uh-huh. in the world is your oyster and all that stuff. But um, yeah, it was it was a little daunting because I knew it was a great program. Um, people came from all over the country. And they were all ages. You know, I was only 23 then, so on the younger side. Um, so there's some second career people and stuff absolutely. like that. Absolutely. There really? were people. Okay. The current poet laureate um, went to school there when he was there when I was there. Wow. Um, of the poet, country? Of the country. Who is that? Um, oh, gosh. <sighs> don't, don't the poet, doesn't the poet laureate of the country read sometimes at the presidential inauguration? Yeah. And of course. Some things like that. And he'll that's have to kind read of his occasional pro- poems, but... Wow. wow, we'll have to look that up quick because all of a sudden I'm not remembering his name. Okay, we can Google it, or mm-hmm. listeners can Google it. Yeah, do it. Homework. Yeah. <laughs> um, Is there? He and he had children, and his wife was there, and there were others at the same time. Who, huh. You know, just had families there, and so that was that was inspiring that they just took time out from their track, basically, to to do this. Is it competitive? Know? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? When you're there? Or yeah, when you're there. Mm-hmm. So you can feel it. Like, is it like you got to really step it up? And Yeah. Juan Felipe Herrera is his name, by the way. I just oh. remembered it. Okay. Oh, great. Um, yeah. You, you know, the actual workshop class is, is once a week. And then other than that, you take seminars and you can take um, whatever else you want to take. Um, and... Um, yeah, the workshop class is the one that everybody pays the most attention to. And that was on Mondays when I was there. So at the time, you would put your, your poems or your, your short stories onto actual, you know, physical little wooden shelves, little cubby holes. Hmm. And if your poem or, or story or whatever it was you were writing then disappeared off the shelves, then that was a good sign that oh, you had cool. done something, <laughs> you know, something worth paying attention to. <clears throat> so of course, if it if that didn't happen, then then you were sad because mm-hmm. you know it just and you could watch your classmates as they some of them really caught a wave and others of them did not probably yeah mm-hmm. with the fiction writers and the poets it was different though because the fiction writers had a chance of coming into some money at some point even before too long and the workshop would get calls even from Hollywood <clears throat> I heard this. Um, asking how to end a film. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. And they were getting published um, because people just, more people read fiction, frankly, right? Mm-hmm. We all know mm-hmm. this. Yeah. Um, and financially, if you're going to be a creative writer, that's probably the route to go. Mm-hmm. Um, for poets, it's more difficult to support yourself on poetry, unless you teach, like anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but... So, in a sense, that was a load off because we're not even really worried about how to make a paycheck, um, you know, on our, on poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it was different. What does it feel like to feel yourself getting better as a poet? Totally thrilling. Can you measure? You know what that's like. Well, like I kind of mm-hmm. do, but how do you measure it? Like you what? You can't. Or how do you know? What does your gut say? 
um, or your brain. Are there, or your is heart. there te- technique things that you can track? Like, what is that like? Um, well, this is still happening to me. It should be happening to everybody, right? right? Throughout their entire lives, no matter cre- what they do. Right, whatever creative thing they're doing, yeah. I mean, we hope that we just keep growing no matter what it is we do, right? Um, creatively or otherwise. Uh, I don't think there's any way to measure it, though. And you certainly can't measure it by the attention you get. You can't ever... Um, well, you should never pander to an audience anyway. Yeah. If you're a poet or, or maybe anybody. Yeah, or maybe anybody, um, yeah. Exactly. So you can't measure it that way. I guess all you can do is go by your gut feeling. And if you're an INFP, then <laughs> <laughs> maybe you've got a good sense. And so... <laughs> it, it is funny to... To try to figure out, because I do occasionally have a sense of like, well, I'm really getting better at this. You do have a sense of that? Yeah. But and how do you t- measure it? It's- well, I think it gets easier over time. Yeah. And I'm really, when we have this podcast and we talk to creative people, I think it's almost like the longer they've been in it, the more fun it is to talk to them. Because huh. if you've been in doing whatever your thing is for a long time, then you have the luxury of retrospect mm-hmm. that other stages of life you might not have. Yeah. So if you've been in for decades, you can look back and see the ups and downs and the arcs and sort of the dramatic uh, flow of your whole process over right. over time. And I think, so the farther out I get, I can look back and see phases and trends in my, in my writing and in my mm-hmm. passions and in my skill level. And then I think it gets easier to identify... Like, oh, yeah, I'm getting good at, at this part of it, you know? Hmm. Uh, and so, that's fun, I think. <laughs> do you go back and um, listen to songs and maybe at the time you love them, but, you know, now you don't so much. But some last. I mean, there are some that yeah, last for you. Totally. Yep. And I think... And those are unpredictable, really. Yeah. I think as I get older, I'm getting more and more choosy about my own catalog, mm. which I've only started thinking about this in the last year or two whereas I always used to tell people that um, I felt a little bit different as a songwriter because I always felt like I claimed every song in my catalog from when I was a teenager until now Mm -hmm. and I and I honestly did feel that way for a long long time like you know it's all equally legit and and of course it is legit that's not maybe not the right word but as I get older now I'm I have raised my standards on my own catalog. Good. And I didn't feel that way before, but now I really do. Yeah. And now I think, you know, there are things that I'm fine now to let slide into the ether. Mm-hmm. And not that I regret them and not that I'm ashamed. It's not those feelings. But it's just that those ones are okay to... I don't have to revisit those ones. Right. And, they're uh, part of the process. They're part of the process, but I don't have to, and I don't have to say that they're equally good as every other thing. No. And but the, but I can also see the the moments that really were good then and still hold up now. Yeah. And I can feel it when I play it on the instrument, or when I sing it, or when I read the text, or when I play it in concert. And when I feel how the audience is feeling, and mm-hmm. when we're all there together, mm-hmm. like it's oh, you have that. Oh, that helps. Yeah, right. That's right. right. So well, later that. on, let's talk. I want to talk about uh, poetry as performance, but we'll get to that eventually. Okay. But that's a way that I can measure it anyway. Right. And, and it's funny that I feel like as I get older, I'm getting a little more picky. Good. I'm. Uh, that's okay. It's okay. Do you? Why? Well, that, that makes me feel good that you guys are affirming because I'm. I don't want to be snooty or whatever. But why? Why is it good for an artist to get pickier? Because art's important. I mean, you know, you want to. You want to share it with people, and you, it, you know, it's it's important to I think to people's lives. I don't really know a better way to say that. Mm-hmm. Um. But we need it. Mm-hmm. And so you don't want to just exist or subsist on gruel. <laughs> you know, you could. You could, you know. Yeah. Or be like a qual and eat the same thing all the time. I mean, fine, if you had a constant, uh-huh. you know. Delicious you know, meal eucalyptus. Of, exactly. <laughs> a constant meal of, you know, I don't know some sort of art I'm not going to say what but you know then that would be fine but honestly better 
better arts, better for everybody. Uh-huh. So, and it's better for as artists. I think it's better for our lives too because you want to be as big and strive and challenge yourself and mm-hmm. as much as possible because that gives you a better life. Mm-hmm. And so, selfishly speaking. Um, you want to work hard mm-hmm. and make it difficult for yourself and really strive and, and all of that and not just give in to the thing that you think is is easy, even if everybody around you thinks that it's good, if you don't think it's, if you think you can actually do something better that's bigger, that really challenges and pushes and that's more important. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think also you've had the mindset of like, oh, all my songs, they're like my children. Don't ask me to pick a favorite. Don't ask me to that's say that I, I th- don't that I don't like one as much or one has fallen out of favor. That's what I used to say. So I feel like that uh-huh. analogy maybe isn't. It's not like it's, it's I changing. Feel it's changed. They're not your children. <laughs> 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 they're, they're songs. Yeah. That's true. I they're, have they're who you are. They're who, who. It's what you needed to say at the time. Yeah. And now you need to say different things. Yeah. yeah. That's true. I I have changed. That's for sure. I also feel good to hear. It, it, it's affirming to hear another artist talk about um, striving and really valuing the art and talking about like. <laughs> You know, yeah, we could survive on gruel, but we don't have to. And because I think if I'm ever guilty of anything in the arts, it is I have a tendency to devalue or to play down the value of art and Mm -hmm. to sort of um, think because I'm so function over form Mm -hmm. that I tend to be tempted to value the functional. And if things get a little less functional, a little more formy, I... I have an inclination to sort of discount it a right. little bit, and so what if it's you can really find a perfect balance. Though that's difficult, right? Do you think that's a good goal? Is to be a, have well, a healthy balance between it's my impression, two? anyway? Mm-hmm. Um, because, well, for one thing, it, it it's supposed to tell you that you're 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 aiming for something that does does everything, does both, and so <laughs> it's a it's a happy medium. But in fact, that's very difficult to achieve. Right. Right? Yeah. So, it seems like a good goal, Jonathan. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> well, and I think, too, as I get older, like I said, my standards are, I think I'm getting more passionate about creative t- creativity in general and then my own work. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm valuing my own work more than I did before. I don't know, Don. what do you think? Yeah, I think it's... It comes with having done something for decades. Mm-hmm. You can't just keep barreling forward mm-hmm. without kind of looking back and saying, "Now, what did I, what did I do again?" And how you don't want to be the same kind of artist. Yeah, not the your exact whole same path. It's better to diverge. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but it's funny. There's always a part of me that's that sort of um, uh, trying to avoid uh, inward wankery. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so I've got a real police siren that goes off if I'm if I can smell that in the air, you know. Yeah. And I'm, maybe I'm a little paranoid about that. Like I don't want to be that guy, you know. Yeah. Or I don't. I don't know. It's just I have a. And I don't think you know I'm. That's not really who I am. I think in my core anyway. Right. So I think my paranoia is unfounded, probably. But still, it's there's a trace of it in my brain that I have to fight with. It's probably everyone. unfounded, but I still think that it's good to yeah. be wary nonetheless. Yeah. yeah. Did you uh, ever have a phase in your career where you felt like uh, your valuing of the work and of the art itself was a little bit less than it is now? or at, Did you have a, a dip? My valuing? Um, um, actually, yeah. I suppose, you know, for a long time... I, I didn't write, and that was when kids were young and I had reached a point where um, I was sort of, I sort of had a, maybe a, like a name in the community, and, and um, this is, okay, this is, I probably was sort of expected to step up as a, as a local poet and do some things, which I think is important you know Mm -hmm. it's really important and i am not very good at that frankly 
The poet, hustle, you mean? The hustle, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, um, there are poets who can write occasional poems. I mean, poems that are specific to an occasion. Yeah. Um, like, for example, Juan Felipe Herrera. Right. He's, he's there, and I'm so um, thankful that we have a seat at that level in our country for somebody like him. Yeah. And, um, and the others who came before him. Um, and I, I just am not very good at that, that kind of work, you know, but to be able to step up to the plate and try to hit, hit a home run mm-hmm. for a specific occasion. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, to not necessarily please, but, but to accommodate the desires of a population in that way is something that I, I have. You know, I'm not able to do. Not that that was being asked of me, but I reached a point where maybe I was asked to do it a couple times or something, and I couldn't do it. And then also the kids needed more attention. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I think there were a number of things that, that gave me a falling out. And probably also I had reached a point where, with the work where I realized I could write a decent poem. Like that was relatively easy to do, to write a decent poem. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't um, writing any really good poems at that poem that point. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I, yeah, I stopped doing it for some time. It's hard to do any kind of creative work, I think, when you have little kids in the house. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah, you know about it. You guys yeah. both know about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember when I met Dawn mm-hmm. in high school, I th- always thought she reminded me of you. Hmm. And even in your hair and the way you speak, your speech uh-huh. patterns, and the fact that you have a lot of bi- biographical stuff in common, you know, like pastors' kids from Escanaba who play the piano and right. who are intelligent and artsy, and right. and so when I met Dawn, I always thought, oh, this, Thank you, Beth. she's very much, like, <laughs> very much anyway. like my cousin Beth, who is <sighs> so influential and and uh, our dads so, are good friends too, and your dads yeah. were pals, and yeah. so I would love to hear the two of you. Talk about Escanaba, because what are the chances that, you know, here you are decades later, but you both grew up in the same small little town. I mean, I'd love to just hear that. And I don't know. He's nerding out on Escanaba. He is. He is. Well, you know, he he always his phrase was that Escanaba was the Paris of the UP. Wow. I love that. He I think he he sort of started learning about the culture scene with you well, and, you and Mer- Meredith. Yep. And then when when we started dating and he realized that we had this, you know, this full voice corral of high school mm-hmm. students with what 40 or 50 students and yep. half of them were half of them were guys. Yeah. And then he had he had his high school choir of 10 people with one guy. Yeah, and, and it was like the nerdiest, most outcast and, group of people. And in the no world. shows. Were you that guy? No, no, it was the guy. No, okay. and then, uh, but in Escanaba, yeah, like the choir was filled the play with like, popular and jocks. And I didn't it realize. Blew it didn't my really, mind because I I moved to Escanaba in seventh grade and then um, just continued through high school and I thought it was a great creative experience. I didn't realize that it was that much different from the rest of the UP, honestly. Yeah, it always felt way more cultured and like a huge city yeah. with huge opportunities compared to where I was living. Yeah. And I knew that uh, when I would come to visit you and Meredith, and then I knew that too then when Dawn was in high school and I'd come to the to go to the homecoming dance or whatever, and it would just, mm-hmm. I couldn't believe it. Well, Don, so you, you did music mainly, like through and through, piano and... Yes. and um, Band for a while, mm-hmm. and then singing, and singing in the musicals. Yeah, so that all worked out. I, I tried it all, and I guess it was great because I found all of it in Escanaba. I um, played violin started when I was six, and then p- played piano starting from age ten with lessons mm-hmm. with Ruth Chown, and um, did ballet. For the for the listeners, it's important to know that Beth and Dawn had the same piano teacher. Yes, same piano teacher as my mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it's important to us, and now it's important to you because you're listening. Um, and theater that was big. Yeah, I did that, that too. Was... That was fun. Um, even a musical. I think I was in Bye Bye Birdie. 
um, I refused to play violin in the pit orchestra because I really wanted to get out of the pit and get up on stage because that was, you know, just, I just really wanted to. Were you one of the teenage girls? Oh yeah, I just wanted teenage girls, Okay, you know, and um, that was fun. And then I discovered uh, poetry, probably as a junior, high school junior. In a and, class? Uh-huh. Who was your teacher? Um, oh, gosh, again with the names. Mr. Um, Burroughs? Yes, Mr. Burroughs. Okay. Very good. <laughs> he was great. Oh, Mr. Burroughs. Mr. And Burroughs. Mr. Fix was another one that was yeah. really important to me. He taught English. Did any of your high school teachers in English ever know that you went on to Iowa Writers Workshop and became I, a poet for real? I don't know. I don't know. You, poet for real. You didn't go back and visit them or <laughs> anything like that? Um, I went back. So, you know, once I, when I went to undergrad, I pretty much never really returned to Escanaba. I went to Fortune Lake and, you know, spent the summers there for the most part. But, but then your family moved. And then they moved to Iron Mountain. So and that's another thing you had in common is that both of you went to high school and graduated from Escanaba and then your parents moved away and then you had a hometown that you never had a chance to visit. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, you guys really had a lot of parallel experiences. Yeah, it's true. I always think, it's Beth, neat. about you that in my, as a child, I had no experience or exposure to classical music at mm-hmm. all until you were in high school and mm-hmm. you were in the UP Youth Orchestra. Orchestra at Northern. And my family would go to hear you perform at on campus all the time like once a year so the first time I ever heard real classical music was sitting in the audience listening to you play the violin and uh, and of course now Pavo and Svea are playing the violin and now I'm going to their concerts but you know I you know you were doing stuff as a young adult when I was you know younger than you that I didn't know anybody who did any of that stuff. Yeah, but I always went by the book. You know, I know how to read music and starting with Suzuki at age six and all that. But you could go and um, just pick something up. Yeah. Just absorb it, basically. (laughs) And I was recently telling my friend Jeff about how you had that upright piano in the, the basement of one of your houses. And... I don't think any, I don't know what else was in that basement other than maybe the washer and dryer and the cement yep, blocks that's, and the that's cement right. floor. But the piano was set there right at the base of the stairs, and so you could get down there, and you either had to sit on that piano bench or squeeze yourself to the right or left of that instrument yeah. and go do something else, whatever else. So that's where you would go and practice. or like, It wasn't yeah. even practice, just played. That's how you spent your time. Yeah, I spent my, gosh, my eighth, eighth grade through senior year just mm-hmm. jamming on that I upright that. piano for hours and, and hours. And I was and envious hours. because even though I had started lessons so early and um, I had gained something by learning to read music and to sight read and to, you know, transpose into all that, but... You could just sit down and play. Yeah. And to me, that's what's that's what writing poetry is more like, and I think it's more freeing. Yeah. Um, and I imagine writing music is like that too. You just sort of sit down and play. You know, you just sit down and and do something yeah. instead of following the instructions on the page. I was looking through your book mm-hmm. earlier today, and I've read it a few times over the years, and I've always been aware that there are a lot of Uper references oh, in yeah. your poems mm-hmm. and even some of the new poetry of yours that I've found on YouTube recently th- there were some things about that seemed obviously UP imagery hmm. and uh, so I wanted to ask what is it what about being a Uper has impacted you because mm-hmm. it seems like you really identify that way yeah in your adult life even though you don't live there anymore right I don't for the time being <laughs> but um, I suppose really none of us can or would want to escape, you know, the place that was important to us when we were young. Um, I don't think that I specifically write about the UP. I maybe did it once in, in my book. Um, but that's partly because I don't specifically write about, uh, you know, now that I'm trying to say this, I'm changing my mind. It's not true. I've written specifically about some places. Um I think that what's important to me about the UP is that I felt so, like I expanded so much while I was there. It um, it brought out the best in me. Hmm. So it's so it's it's not so much about the birch trees in Lake Superior Mm -hmm. and and you know campfires and and in saunas and all of that. It's not so much about that Hmm. as it is about the fact that the place is so important to me. 
Yeah. I, I really, as I get older, identify more and more as a youper and as a Finnish American. Mm-hmm. And I guess I didn't expect that was going to happen to me. That was just a sort of an unusual surprise that just came with getting older that I, I guess I didn't yeah. count on. And then it's also a little funny that I have two children who are not youpers. They were born here in the city and they growing up in the city. And uh, and they're awesome, and they go to the UP on vacation, but they're they're not Uber's at all. Yeah, my kids neither. And I there's a part of me that feels a little bit bad that I didn't raise any Uber's. You know, mm-hmm. like I feel like I owe it to the I world. Not, I do not feel bad. And Don doesn't feel bad. <laughs> but and I, and the other thing is about it. I think I've idealized it and romanticized it as yeah. a as a place and as a culture. And Don is the voice of reason. And I and I do. I do know intellectually that, you know, that it's a it's just a normal place with normal people, and it's not a perfect place. But my first inclination or my emotional draw is this uh, to idealize it. Yeah. And I don't know how. What do you think about that? I think that that's um, not uncommon. Not that it's a common goal. Common in the negative sense, it's not a common goal. Yeah. It's a good goal. Um, and it doesn't surprise me mm-hmm. because it is an inspirational place. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just mighty, really. Mm-hmm. It's fast. Um, it's it's just not something that I pursue artistically. Uh-huh. Is to go and write something that's a, you know, about the UP. I think I I really just did it the one time. Mm-hmm. Generally, I feel like if something is 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 great in itself, an experience I had or or a place, or um, you know, any moment that is good as is. It doesn't need to be um, redrawn, you know, through some art form. Hmm. Um, usually, though, if something really strikes me as being so important, mm-hmm. um, I will try to introduce some other elements to it, one or two other things, so that I've I worked it into a new place, and I want to explore that ask some questions about that mm-hmm. um so yeah i don't write about the U. I, I i wrote about the up probably when i when i first started to write um you know poems because because i loved it i love it um and my my dad had one in his side table next to the bed a poem about like cousins in the sauna uh-huh. actually i wonder wow. where that where that is right now uh-huh. um but I've moved away about writing specifically about a place. Unless there's a way to create something new beyond the place itself. Yeah. Because it's good. It doesn't need me. Uh-huh. You know, the UP doesn't need me. I need the UP, but that's different. Yeah. You know? Wow. That's an interesting way to say it. Now, I was reading one of your new poems mm-hmm. online that someone was blogging about your poem. I think it's called Sober. Oh, yeah. And... There was an image in that poem that I just thought of the Quad Cities, which you've lived in for a long time. Yeah. And there was some line about uh, the clouds over the bridge. Yeah. And I was just imagining all those gigantic industrial bridges going to Davenport from mm-hmm. where you live. Exactly. And I don't know if that's what you were... Of course. Yeah, so I do draw in elements of the landscape and, yeah. and whatever place I happen to be in, because that is important. Yeah. Um, and boy, those... The, just the geometry of the Quad Cities, mm-hmm. it gets me excited. Just the, mm-hmm. all the, the river and the bridges and the hills and the bu- buildings. And I, I think that's an amazingly rich... It uh, is. It's a thrilling and, place, too. It's a cool, cool-looking place yeah. to just be. Yeah. Uh, can you... Would you read us that one? Uh, just because I'm talking I, about it? Sure. Or, or you could read whatever you want. But I, I guess I'm thinking of that one. I'll have to read that. I'll have to find it. You'll have to give me your Wi-Fi and, and, password and all of that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Stuff. We'll, we'll, um, here, let's pause it. And pause. Don, could you run and get the Wi-Fi password from the, little, <laughs> from the little sticky thing? Well, here, I'll just keep talking. We'll see if we can do this while you type. We can. Um, so I... You know, I, the poems of yours that I know are the ones in the book, which was published in um, uh, back in 2001. One. So that's getting to be out there for a long yes, time. Yes, it is. And so I thought, well, I wonder, when I knew you were going to come on the podcast, I thought, I wonder what's just out there online so that when I post this podcast, I can link people 
backwards to find you online. Sure. And then I found this blog, and then I found the YouTube videos of you reading the poem, and I thought, yeah. oh, Beth has new stuff that's, and it actually seems like it's pretty new, right? It's very new. That's the Midwest Writing Center. That's a, it's a local um, hub. Oh, great. Wow. It's a really long You guys password. are those people that do the all caps and the, okay. So, yes. CenturyLink... Okay, I'm not going to say anything more. We don't want the podcast listeners no, to no, learn our no, password no. and then be squatting outside. <laughs> <laughs> we love our listeners, but you're not allowed to Stop make a tent in the backyard and get online at our on our Wi-Fi network. What do you think about um, the Quad Cities, Don? While Beth's typing, yeah, you know the Quad Cities, don't you? I know them. See, another thing you guys have in common a, is that yeah, you right. spent quantity time in Rock Island. And, and Not only that, but Augustana College. Right. Yes, yes. Yes. Augustana College. I've Rock been Island following Island. you, Beth, my, <laughs> my first 21 years of life. Yeah. Um, well, I think my, my view of it was probably more limited just because campus life is most of your life. Yeah. And when you did have a chance... You didn't get out people, to, the, to the city city. Right. Well, and I think it was a different place... From of 88 course. to 92 because of the, uh, you know, the recession was yep. starting to move into motion there. And the revitalization that's happened in so many of the areas there just hadn't even begun to right. when rev I, up. I, I think when I first got there, International Harvester, they were still sort of suffering from the loss of that and mm-hmm. just, you know, making a comeback. But it's really, it's just becoming a... a you know, I've lived there now for 25 years, so half my life. For our yeah. listeners' sake, we're talking about Rock Island, Illinois, mm-hmm. which is part of the Quad Cities, two cities in Illinois, two cities in Iowa, with the Mississippi River going between. Yeah. And it's an important metro area for our family because Dawn's parents both met. Uh, they met one another there at Augustana College, and then Dawn went to college there. She's third-generation uh, Augie grad. And then Dawn and I got engaged there. On and, the river. And then I have cousins on both sides of my family on that were students there. Mm-hmm. And Beth... My sister was a student Beth there. Was a, you had, Beth's sister was a student there. And, now and Beth, she met her husband there in Rock Island. Oh, yeah. Rock Island Brewing Company, playing in a band. And now Beth works there at Augustana College. Yeah. So th- it's funny that that particular little <clears throat> few square blocks was so uh, pivotal for the people in my family network, for sure. It's a great place for art. Um, it's a great place for visual art. There's also um, a symphony and professional ballet company. And all you indie rock people out there would know that Day Trotter. Day Trotter, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, they've really gone gangbusters with that. It's, it's great. Did it work? Did you jump online? I found it. Yep. Here great. It is. Well, we've never had a guest who was able to do their art on the show <laughs> just because it's hard to ask an actor to. Now act on this podcast, you know, but a poet can do it. And so this is exciting. It's a great thing about poetry. I don't Instantly to the people. Yeah. So tell us, um, I, I don't even know how to ask a poet to deliver a poem oh. in vocally. So tell us, what's, how, how's this going to work? Well, generally, if a poet goes up and reads a poem, he or she might say a couple words about it or just not, depending on their style and level of familiarity with um you know, performing poems on stage. And really, anything goes. What do you prefer? Oh, well, I like to say a couple of things. Um, I've been told that I talk too much, which is weird to me. I can't even imagine. But, <laughs> well, obviously, this is working out okay, so I know how to do it. But what did I say about this recently? I read it. Um, I think I talked about how, yeah, well, you know, it's, in, it's there in that, that, you know, you can find it on YouTube. But yeah, I, I, I decided to write this when thinking about um, people, people that I, you know, that I know, people that I mean, everybody has people in their family who are trying to kick a habit of some sort. And generally, I think uh, alcohol is the main habit that people are trying to kick, it seems. And it's, it's, it's just pervasive, you know, among the population. And so there are a number of people who are trying to, I just thought about this, you know, live their days in, in an interesting, worthwhile way because life is a miracle. 
And so we want it to be special, and we want it to be, well, really, we want every day to be special because it's, it's a gift, you know? Um, but if you're, if you're used to, if you, if you have an addiction and, and then you're, you're you know, trying to live your life without it, that just changes things. It strikes me that it just changes how you, how you live your hours mm-hmm. and what a weight that can be. It's a weight anyway. I mean, I find going through time to be um, problematic. I always want to be you know, doing something, you know, compelling or at least interesting Mm -hmm. and to feel like I'm you know just sort of you know pushing through to somewhere and Mm -hmm. not just giving up you know moment to moment yeah so for you know some people that's more difficult I think just depending on the personality and what they're going through personally so I was thinking about that when I wrote this Mm -hmm. and it's called sober and really it's for anybody who has that kind of relationship with time I think all right so sober walk into the bedroom put new sheets on the bed and pillowcases walk out the house into daylight turn up the alley notice rutabagas don't know what they are no enough though notice the clouds above your head and they nod so slowly Clouds over the bridge, building like marble headstones. There are flowers all over. They don't seem to matter much. There is always greenery everywhere yearning past hunger. Hunger shaped like a hanger or a hunter. Eat dull food after preparing it with sharp knives. Dull is plodding from place to place, placing yourself. Put yourself into a wanted sign, a kind of distraction. Use the garden, that's what it's for. Listen to song, that's what it's for. Hear how songs make edges finer, it's what you wanted. Things with edges make corners and borders on time. They are there to remind you, you should feel hurt. Trains, cicadas, near riots, parents, signs for prisoner of war missing in action, wanter, signs for this place is for sale, writing on the walk, empty cans, waking hour, want, can't. That's it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> or I should do the snap, right? <laughs> That's the first poem we've ever had on our podcast. Woo-hoo! It's incredible. I'm honored. Beth. Thank you. How Thank new you. is that? Um, well, I'm trying to write a poem a week, but this one, I'm not really managing it because I'm doing other stuff, but that's okay. Uh, I guess this is probably maybe a month old. Uh-huh. And why did you choose to read it at that YouTube reading that I saw? Um, was it the newest see. one at the time or something? It was probably. Maybe it was, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It was a challenge from the um, uh, a friend of mine who, um, Holly Norton is her name, and she, she, um, she had a like a residency at the Midwest Writing Center, which is located in downtown Davenport. And she had a really cool prompt or challenge for, for local people writing poetry to call her voicemail and to leave a poem on like her voicemail. Wow. She, wanted, she hasn't actually done the, the audio for this yet, uh-huh. but um, she just wanted that crackly you know, sound that we're all used to on yeah. voicemail. I decided to read this one because it's, for me, it's, it's slightly on the long side actually uh-huh. um, I was curious to read it because it's every line is a sentence I, I, I guess I wanted that sort of plotting effect of that um, and I just thought it would sound good basically yeah mm-hmm. well I got to tell you the story of how I experienced that poem because like I mentioned before I was looking for your online presence just so I could get a sense of where I might link backwards to you after this podcast goes up. Yeah. And the first time I saw any evidence of you was 
a relatively new blog entry by somebody in Iowa or whatever who posted the text for that poem. So I read it before I heard it. Mm -hmm. And as I read it, I just, well, I thought it was great. And I loved, my favorite part was Hunger Hanger Hunter. Sure, you know what's happening there, I bet. Well, I'll, I don't know what, what, your, what your intention is uh, necessarily thematically, but mm-hmm. I was drawn to the, the shape of the text on the page. Yeah, nice. And the, the length of each word... And the ER endings with the H's, yeah. and and just how you laid it out uh, in relation to the lines and spaces and stuff, and right. that's and I and that's I was probably a bit of a like a primer on on a lot of things that I do, but that one is is so simple in a sense because it just you're just switching out a letter in each word. Yeah, well, I just no, I no. loved how it looked visually, yeah. and I loved how it sounded. And I, that is so, I just absolutely love that. And I also noticed as I was looking through your, your printed book earlier this week, too, that you do other things in the layout of the text yeah. that's visually pleasing. So it's almost like the, the relationship to the text on the page becomes part of the poem itself. Oh, yeah, because all that white space around it, you know, it's sort of like a rest in, in music. Yeah. Or just space around, around music. You yeah. Know? I think it's important to the rhythm of it. Yeah, so I really loved that part, and uh, and then I also love the list at the end mm-hmm. because I love songs that have lists too, mm-hmm. uh, and just the fact that you wound that up with that whole bunch of you know just a, a big list. I, I just love all that kind of approach. In fact, I I was inspired even to think I haven't written a list song for a long time, mm-hmm. and and I like them so much that I think I should really. I should really do another one. Yeah, you know, seems like, like it seems should. like a, an autumn poem. Oh, good. It well, there's really lots seems... of foliage in it, you know, and <laughs> but, rutabagas and leaves, and but also sort of giving up something. Right. It just <laughs> seems. It's, it just you know, struggling, maybe. <laughs> right. It just seemed to me to be how I feel at autumn. Mm-hmm. Anyway, of like, oh no, yeah, <laughs> it's coming. There's a lot to face. There is. Ahead. There is. Well, after I read it on, the, on that blog, then it turned up again in YouTube mm-hmm. on the same Google search. And then I got to, my, so my second ex- exposure to, was to watch you read it on the microphone. <laughs> and that was cool, too, because, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's cool how poems can exist as, they can exist as just words in and of themselves, but then they can exist as text on a page which is a whole other ball of wax yes and then they can exist as delivery and on a sound. microphone or sound yeah that's and what i love about it too that's just so cool like and yeah. then, of course like everybody knows that um everybody knows that sort of uh in their brain or whatever but mm-hmm. you know at least i never think about that mm-hmm. so when you take when you step back and think about it it gets really exciting yeah so what do you think is do you have a favorite or a what do you think about those three ways to to have that a poem exists? Um, I guess you know I begin with the sound of it, but that's closely. I mean, obviously that's the the language itself. Yeah. Um, but then you know, shortly after that, the way it looks on the page, I mean, that's very closely related because that helps determine the sound of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's. Because all of that space around lines has a sound itself, right? In a sense, or or it, it doesn't really have a sound, but it influences the way things sound. So yeah. it's all just interrelated. I'm not sure. You know, I think that there. I think that reading a poem aloud is is not necessarily. There there's so many really great poets who never could really do a, a very good job reading their poems aloud. Um, so that's a kind of a different thing. Mm-hmm. I think reading a poem aloud, you know, just like just like when you write an essay or something, I think it's important to read it out loud to yourself so you can hear where the gaps are, mm-hmm. the gaps that you don't want at least, and, mm-hmm. and how things could be fixed language wise. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, reading out reading it out loud for an audience that's that's pure performance, and so that yeah. you cannot necessarily expect to be able to. You know, I don't think that poets need to be performers, 
really, I think the primary job is to create the thing that everybody can access, which is the poem that's on the page or, or you know, you know, online or whatever. Yeah. Do you like to read your own work? Oh, either yeah. in mm-hmm. either uh, in a performance setting or in a reading setting. I do. I love it at the moment that I'm doing it. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, I think it's. Um, I don't really. Um, it's a challenge, of course, but you know, even though I'm, you know, relatively shy, I guess I don't have any aversion to going up on stage and reading into a into a microphone. That doesn't necessarily mean though that I'm I'm very good at it and want to hear myself later, like. Like when I listen to this later, oh, it's just going to be irritating to me. <laughs> it really, it's just going to be too much. And um, I will have spoken too quickly. I already know this. <laughs> um, I tried to slow down the second stanza. Uh huh. Wow. And I think it's really important to read slowly. And um, you know, it's just that's just difficult. And other than that, I mean, you know, everybody has that problem hearing their own voice. You know, it's just. Too. Yeah. Ugh. Well, I think putting that, salt on salt. that comes with practice, I think, because if you don't hear your own voice very op- very often, it's really gross and bad. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the more you do, just because of the way your own voice science sounds outside of your skull, mm-hmm. you can, over time, you get used to yourself. And then it gets less gross. In my experience, it gets less gross with time. Yeah. Whereas most people who aren't broadcasting their voice very often when they do hear it they think that doesn't sound like me you know right. and that makes them uncomfortable um well it's interesting to hear you you know reading your own work and i've been thinking about what does it mean to interpret for the public a uh, a, a poem or a song and i think one thing that's new for me in my new in my older age is i think i'm becoming an interpreter for, After the, for the first during time, or? during, for okay. the first time. Whereas before, I think when I played my songs or any other songs, my, I never, ever considered that I was interpreting anything. Mm-hmm. I was strictly a, a speaker for the, for the content. I was just only a micro, I was just a, a, a noisemaker for the, for the uh, content. Right. And now as I get older, and I think it really happened after playing Finnish folk music. Mm-hmm. I realized that now I'm interpreting the the content itself and making choices within the delivery from what the what the work itself is giving to me. So does that mean when you say that you're interpreting it as you're delivering, does that mean that you're just putting yourself into the place of someone that would be listening to you? No, it's like I'm feeling the content for the first time. You do that. You try to do that every time that you're actually. Okay, you do that as you're creating it. And, and, and I'm talking in the performance part. And in Af- the performance after part. it's yeah. already written. I think that's really important. Yeah, and I think for many, for decades, I didn't do that at all. Yeah, like I was strictly like needle on the record. Right. You know, and and my goal was to get to the end. Not that I didn't like it, but my yeah. goal was like, well, now I'm going to play this song. And I'll know I will have succeeded when the song is over. <laughs> yeah, I think you've landed on something that's really important, and I've thought about the same thing. I just uh-huh. didn't think about it as interpreting. Yeah, I thought about it as um, just, you know, very simply paying attention to yeah. what was happening. Um, but I, you know, that's that will change everything. That brings it to life to right. pay attention to it. I mean, it's just like anything else. You you look at it, and all of a sudden, it has. A presence. Right. And I, I think I learned that when I was playing uh, Finnish folk music because the practice of that experience was to play tunes that I didn't write. Yeah. And to play tunes that I had no roots in. Good. Like, and I'm playing, I'm playing polkas, but I'm not a dancer. And I'm playing mm-hmm. tunes from Finland 300 years ago, but I'm, I'm, I'm an American. And I, I, so I had, it was not a personal necessarily uh, the content itself was not from me, mm-hmm. but I, my job was the interpreter of it. I yeah. was the deliverer of, of that tune. Yeah. And I think I, for the first time in my musical career, I got the sense that I'm an interpreter. And that's what people always say like about Emmy Lou Harris. You know, mm-hmm. They say, no one thinks of Emmy Lou as a songwriter, although she is, but they think of her as an interpreter. And so what makes her a genius is that she can sing Wildwood Flower by the Carter family. 
-hmm. And her interpretation of it is so beautiful and so great that that's why she's Emmylou Harris. Because her delivery and her phrasing and her her interpretation is just incredibly great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, musicians we could talk about who do that with with the work they do. And I think so it was helpful to play tunes that weren't my own because my only option was to interpret them. Yeah. Because it wasn't my tune. And, and then I realized that, my gosh, I can interpret my tunes. And you can do it as you're writing your tunes or writing your yeah, poems, I sure. think. And that's really an important move, I think, on the part of the creator to, to yeah. you know, it's different from, it's just, it's a, I think it's another sidestep to take as you're trying to create something to try to interpret it as you're as you say interpret doesn't quite work for me but i can see what yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah, yeah maybe we can as we go we can think of another word that does that job but i think too like isn't it weird that it, it took me two decades to, to yeah. figure that out but lucky you <laughs> it happened eventually yeah but i guess goes to show that even even two decades into your artwork you can still learn something new yeah. Or you can still have a breakthrough. Or have a new framework. And so I think if you, maybe you have people who know you well, mm-hmm. and they can tell, just like I can kind of tell with him of like, oh, that one, that was a hard show. <laughs> like I can tell when he's just working and working and working, and the, the, the person in the audience just would slogging. think, oh, that was delightful. Right. But I can just tell like, oh, he's that excited. was, <laughs> it, you should be t- paid twice as much as what they, <laughs> because like it was, it was such hard work so I think for Mm -hmm. someone who sort of accompanies you in your creative journey they can tell when you're when you're sort of at I mean it is a higher level yeah when you're interpreting or you're you're really present with your audience up the hill Mm -hmm. yeah and you're really you're you're Mm -hmm. creating this moment this creative moment with all of you in the audience and the performer and you just connect Mm -hmm. in a in a really powerful way versus yeah when the other way happens we have a few more things to ask you, but maybe can you read us one more? Uh, sure. Maybe from your book. Sure. Since we heard something new, maybe you could read us something that's a, over a decade um, old, and you can choose whatever one you want. One of them see. I was thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> was um, the one about uh, spelling. That's oh, a very short one. Sure. Just to contrast, but yep. you can do that one or any one you want, really. And people can find Beth's poems online, and we want you to do that and. R- read some of more of her work anyway so you, but this is but just don't a, don't commission her to write a poem because she won't do that <laughs> that's right everybody knows it now um this one is is kind of tricky to read out loud because it's very short and there are parentheses in it which are important to look at so this is a good example of a poem that needs to be visual uh-huh. um but i'll try it anyway okay and this um, this was very autobiographical, which doesn't necessarily happen. I don't really do that very often. But it was about my daughter, Rosalie, when she was learning to spell, and it is, in fact, called Learning to Spell. All the difference between Illinois and Ireland hangs before us like the task of trying to place a pendulum. Still, while I pace entire pastures of palindrome, ever clever clover, still you, girl with a likeness to space around the eye, spell. That's that one. Yeah. Oh, that's, I love that one. No good. (laughs) Now that one too got some, did that one get published? Oh, that one, my um, good friend Colin Bailey Burns, who's a poet, chose to, for a project that she was doing, called I think Poem in a Box and she had a blog for a while and that was the first one she chose I mean that, I mean, that one really speaks to people who have um, had kids and she's got two daughters older than my kids and mm-hmm. my kids are older than your kids and so I think it's one of those poems that appeals to parents yeah. who feel that language is important and become so thrilled when their kids start to get that too I was also drawn to the uh, the part of that one, which is a little bit like the sober poem, where you, there's mm-hmm. wordplay going mm-hmm. on with the letters. Yeah, I just love that. I just that is, <laughs> Good. So, that is just the greatest. Yeah, I just geek out on that. I time. do too. That's really cool. Well, you know what? Before we wrap it up, I'd love for you to talk about that book, and because uh, that's a book that got published, and anybody could go on to Amazon sure. and buy it. Yeah. And uh, what's it like to have a book? 
Mm. Well, it's it's um, really it's amazing when you when you feel it in your hands because it's it's both heavier and heftier than you imagined. Huh. At the same time, it has its limits, and it's you know approximately you know five inches by seven uh-huh. or something like that. Uh-huh. Has a cover design, has a certain number of pages, and you can look back and say, oh, "Gosh, you know, I started writing this one all those years ago," and. Um, you really have to. It's just it's just strange because you're you know you you spent all that time and all that history working with these things, and then it ends up that it's something on a page. Yeah. And somebody can buy it or not buy it. Uh huh. Um, it's it's a fascinating experience. I mean, I guess I reached a point where I decided I wanted to write another book because. It's it's a great goal. Are you and, in that phase now, yeah. wanting to write another book? Yeah, I'm working on it. I uh, have bought, I need about another 15 poems to finish it up, and then I'll have a second manuscript. All right. Does that one you're holding there does that feel old since it came out in yep. 01? Well, it feels it feels old in terms of its yes, it feels old. But some of the poems I I really like. Um, you know, I'm supposed to like all of them, but you know, sometimes you move you move past certain things, and yeah. some of them I think last, and so some don't feel just old, but feel old and also new again when uh-huh. I read them, and so that's a good thing. Yeah, wow. Well, mm-hmm. So that happens to you, where a, if a poem that sort of uh, maybe drifted away from you a little bit o- over time, you'll it'll re uh, reveal itself again to you later on. Exactly. Wow. Sometimes a line will just pop up. And, Usually because of the rhythm of it. Yeah. When you look at a book, how many poems are in that book? Probably about 50, 45 maybe. Yeah, so that's a lot of stuff. When you look at those, can you remember, oh, I was sitting here when I wrote this. Absolutely. So you can go back to that. Not every single one, but, but yes. yeah, you got a real sense of like where you were, what was going on, what you were inspired mm-hmm. by. And most of them, of course, took two or seven or nine takes so yeah i was gonna ask how many drafts before you feel like it's done um it just really depends i mean there are some poems that really just come out yeah you know full force and that's Mm -hmm. that's that those are fun ones aren't they i mean that's songs like that are that come out that fast they're very gratifying it's really fun i know and you think you'll never do it again Uh uh-huh and you bemoan the fact but yeah every now and then it happens again yeah i also get the sense too that like every time you finish a song speaking for myself here that there's always a part of me that thinks, well, you know, I might not ever, ever write any other song anymore, ever. Oh, me too. And, and so you're sad, because you're... Yeah, like, there's always a oh, little melancholy, that was that, like, I guess. that's it. It's been a good run. <laughs> What's for dinner? <laughs> yeah. So, and then it never gets old. Like, no. when a new one comes floating along, it's, it's always equally, for me anyway, kind of amazing that it even so happened. So amazing, and you're so grateful, and you just, it's like you get, you know... Tears sometimes, thinking, "Oh, it can still happen." It's yeah, happy. It's a great. That's that's an amazing thing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when I write in something new, especially when I didn't expect it to come along, like I can, if I make a demo of it or a little recording of it, I could listen to it a hundred times. Yeah, and and it's because I just can't believe it happened. Yeah, and it's almost beyond my control. You know what I mean? Like it should it, be beyond your control, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. That's why you can listen to it a hundred times. Yeah. 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 If it was only about you, you know, you would move on and do the next thing. Right. I yeah. Think. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle to, to make something. It's really, mm-hmm. it's incredible. Can you tell listeners the name of your book so they can search? This one is called Brief Moral History in Blue. And Brief. it was published by, Brief Moral History in Blue, published by New Issues, um, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Western Michigan University. Yeah. And how, how can listeners to this podcast track you down if they are interested in your work and maybe like your book? Um, your book's on Amazon. Sure. Right? And you can Google my name, but a bodybuilder will come up. <laughs> and she's very impressive. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, my brother pointed that out to me a long time ago because he just, you know, back when Google was young, I guess. Uh huh. Um, but, you know, just probably just Google me and maybe poem or poetry. And yeah, you're, um, that would probably do it. Your YouTube stuff came up right away, and so did the blogs that have your work on it. Um, but uh, do you think someday you'll have a Facebook page as a writer? Or oh, I like, don't know. I, I know you're supposed to do that. Uh-huh. 
Because you could make I one guess. for free that just sits there and sure. and uh, <laughs> you know, and you wouldn't have to hustle it. It could just sit there on your behalf. Just sit there. Yeah. I don't have to water it or feed it. Or no, it just you know, just right. Throw up a picture and a link to your Amazon page. Okay. And, is that book still in print? Yes. Okay. Um, and, as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> and who who who's the publisher? Is um, it, uh, New Issues, Poetry and Prose. And yeah. do you know those people personally? Um, the editor um, has passed away since. Okay. But and but there's you know it's it's living thriving. Yeah. It's really a, it's a good press. And if you finish your new book, do you have to go find a home for it or? Well, do you know do. somebody who's going to pick it up? I don't. Um, I will have to schlep that around. And I'm not really sure um, about the steps for that. Back when I tried to get this one published, I basically submitted my manuscript to a bunch of, um, um, you know, like prize prizes, basically, because I wanted to just go for it. And, and I actually, you know, was a finalist for the Yale series of younger poets and some other, you know, series like that. Um, and I also sent it to New Issues because that's where I went to school and I knew those people and I really like like them, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was a finalist for, for these, these prizes and that didn't happen, which is not unexpected. And then New Issues published it, so I was glad. Well, for so the our... next time, I, oh, I don't really know what to do next, basically. Yeah. I'm going to, but I have friends who are writers and they will help me. <laughs> yep. Yep. And the way things are different now than even when this come out is that you could self publish way easier now than you could in two thousand and one. Yeah. Digital publishing sure. and, and do short I know everything short has runs and publication has has really changed. Yeah. I mean it used to be that it had to be on a printed page to be legitimate. Yep. Certainly we all know that's not the case now. Right. And now you could even do a printed page and do uh runs of a uh, hundred books at a time. And yeah. have them in your trunk, you know, and at your house and yeah. whatever. So yeah. anyway, I will put this uh, podcast listeners. I'm going to put links on our Facebook page for Creativity Drill and on our Twitter feed so that you can find Beth Roberts and uh, link backwards to places to find her. And uh, would you um, could people invite you to come and read in their town or sure. uh, How at their that event? Be? Yeah, you'll take it on the road, right? Absolutely. Okay. I I like the road. That'd be cool. Our final question. What would you tell your kindergarten self? My kindergarten self? Oh. Yes. I would tell myself to order more books from that free bookmobile, that thing that came by, and I always felt like I had limits and I could only get three. No. I could have gotten more. (laughs) (laughs) I should have. (laughs) That's good advice. More books. More books. Thank you. That's Beth Roberts. (laughs) Thanks, Beth. Thank you, guys. See you later. Good night. Good night. Creativity Drill.